You're listening to a Roddenberry podcast. You're listening to Mission Log the Orville, an episode by episode discussion of the adventures of the crew of the USS Orville. Welcome to another episode of Mission Log, the Orville, a Roddenberry podcast. The show where we venture into the haunted house that is the USS Orville to look for messages, morals, and meanings, and to see if it aligns with the Roddenberry Star Trek philosophy. This week, we go into the Shadow Realms, the one where the crew explores space that the Krill won't go to. I'm Jessica Lynn Verde. <laughs> and I'm not going into those shadow realms if you're not going, even if the Krill are telling us not to. I'm not a horror fan at all. At any rate, I'm Mike Richards. Mission Log, the Orville is a conversation that depends on your participation. Share your thoughts, ideas, and tell us what we missed at ML underscore the Orville on Twitter, Mission Log on Facebook. You can email us at missionlog the Orville at roddenberry.com. And if you're watching this on the Roddenberry YouTube channel, hit like and subscribe. And remember, we may use your comments on an upcoming episode. So I totally didn't catch, I think, someone in our chat when we were watching the pilot that when Burke is talking to BJ Tanner, a.k.a. Marcus, about like, you know, forgiving yourself, this isn't your fault. She was talking to herself. I didn't realize that she was dealing with her own survivor's guilt. So we do miss things. I miss things. And it was like... revelatory that someone did that that was wonderful that's a really really good point and all the more reason why y'all should be participating in our chat when we premiere the youtube version of this podcast on wednesday uh seven uh eastern uh 4 p.m pacific uh in the u.s on youtube so join us chat with us get in the live chat tell us what we missed have some fun yuck it up it's a good time yuck 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 all right Uh, Now I'm going to tell you what happened today. (laughs) All right. Now here's Jessica with the recap. (sighs) It's time to go where no one has gone before. Okay, I'm sorry. That's the wrong show. But all the same. The Orville has been assigned to pick up Vice Admiral Christie in order to negotiate travel into the Niklov Center, a piece of unexplored territory past Krill space, which the tenuous treaty between the Union and Krill makes possible. And while the odds are pretty good that the Orville will be the lucky ship to make the maiden voyage, a distant look on Dr. Finn's face suggests that she is even further away than the Niklov Center. Enter Vice Admiral Christie. Ah, so that's what was on Finn's mind. It quickly becomes apparent that not only was he a professor of her at the Union School, but he might have been something much more. When he asks Claire to dinner, she mentions that she has plans with her children, which surprises Christie. I mean, Paul. After a vague apology that is 25 years too late, Vice Admiral Christie leaves Dr. Finn to her ice throne. During a soiree with the Krill, Finn grabs Bottle and Kelly in order to have their own commiseration party, leaving Ed to awkward and tension-filled Krill interactions. Halfway through Girl Talk, Dr. Finn lets Kelly know that she has history with Paul. He was a professor, she was his student, they were married, and then they were divorced. It's not that she wasn't heartbroken, but it's been so long that she now looks on it as something she had to go through. The Krill are ready to grant passage into their space under many conditions including a strict and monitored flight path to which the vice admiral diplomatically agrees to. When it's mentioned by Ed that they're interested in exploring the expanse, quote unquote, the krill are taken aback. The Ancala warns of demons that possess anyone who travels there and thus they are forbidden to go. When the vice admiral is adamant at a about exploring that sector, the Krill ominously tell them that they will not stop them, but they will also not save them. The decision, though not straightforward, is made to continue with the exploration. While enjoying a nice solitary dinner at Muska's, Christy ambushes Claire. She is polite despite his obvious agenda. He reveals that he still has their wedding ring, and when he asks if she still has hers, she instead tells him that she doesn't want to overuse a digging metaphor when it comes to their past relationship. He slips the ring on his pinky and tells her he'll just wear it for luck then. Next on his hit list, the Admiral seeks the advice of Isaac, knowing that he and Claire had also been intimate. He asks for advice and some knowledge on Claire, and it becomes clear that not only do they share a past love, they share a heartbreak. 
It's time to go where no one has gone before. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Captain Ed Mercer of the Orville addresses the crew and says that the force may be with them. And they're off. Kiali receives a distress signal directly in the Forbidden Expanse, and they head to see what's up. Uh, but seeing seems to be the problem. The Expanse is a starless void that the crew enters trepidatiously. Not long after they encounter what appears to be a gigantic and frightening space station, Ed, Kelly, Tala, Claire, Christy, and John Lamar head to the spidery-looking thing. A hatch opens up as though welcoming them into a haunted house, and Ed commands them to move in. The interior appears organic and cavernous. No life signs are present as they search the ship. The walls are almost living but made of some type of alloy, and Dr. Finn warns Kelly against touching anything. Lamar finds a beacon that acted as the distress signal. Ed and Christy find flower lights, and Christy gets a closer look, like the idiot he is. The flower opens, and it almost seems to breathe on him. Back on the Orville during their analysis, the Admiral falls to the floor, and when he's turned over, he doesn't look so good. His DNA is being rewritten, and eyes are growing on his forehead and whatever contaminated him was missed on their bio scanners so they head back to the living station but this time in spacesuits duh and get a sample of the flower breath the beacon has changed its tune and is now broadcasting signals to their location next thing you know paul escapes medbay and the systems of the orville are shut down completely isaac and bordis head to engineering claire goes to check on her kids leaving poor nurse park all alone you know, because someone has to die first. It would appear that the Admiral's DNA has been completely rewritten. Ed, Tala, and John attempt to dock manually as they head to the ship. Ty and Marcus aren't at home because they went to go find Claire at the med bay, and the boys are now being hunted by probably Nurse Park or Admiral Christie. I guess he really wasn't happy about Claire having kids. A crew <laughs> member finds the kids, but instead of rescuing them, he gets spit on by Admiral Christie and and automatically the things into a monster as well. Marcus and Ty run and find mom, thank goodness, because these boys have been through enough. Crit deduces that they are dealing with a demon, quote unquote, that is rep- reproducing on people's faces and that the beacon is actually a mating call. John Lamar is traveling down the Jeffries tubes. I, I can't help it. I'm sorry. Internal something or other, but is able to bring auxiliary power back online. Unfortunately, like in any good horror movie, John is in a perfect dis- position to get attacked next and holy crap the horny monster crawl sprints after john it's a mad dash toward salvation and john is able to narrowly avoid mating by locking himself in the brig tala finds john locked up and taunts two of the aliens to chase her now she lures them to storage and she is able to handle him pretty deftly thanks to her super strength and badassery she narrowly avoids being spit on but hey some people like that when one encounters isaac it's confused to say the least Tala brings a defeated body to sickbay, and as John is attempting to bring Quantum Dry back online, a vessel is approaching their coordinates. Looks like a little baby organic ship to me. Finn learns that these aliens have very low immunity currently, and a common cold is enough to kill them, but Ed suggests that they have to try to see if they can save their crew. Finn locates Christy using the Zelayan Sunstone Ring in engineering. After stunning or probably killing a few quote unquote things, they start looking for Paul in engineering in hopes of her being able to still reach the human part of him. She tells Thing Paul to take his new species to the ship that is headed their way. She doesn't get through to him and instead he threatens to assimilate them all. And she says she's going to release that cold virus. And just then, that's when the thing Admiral Christie makes a mating call or something and summons all the remaining aliens to leave. He says, we go, but not forever. Once again, at Muska's, Isaac seeks to find Claire. He wanted to see how she was doing. What ensues is a delightful conversation. She invites him to stay and keep her company. The end. So scary. <laughs> was it really? Was it as scary for you? I, I, you know, it was it was fun to me. It was you know just just just, just a fun haunted house episode. Uh, you know, some jump scares and also you know some meanings, morals, messages we'll get into later uh, sure. that I think yes. we'll we'll have some fun with. Um, this episode written by Brandon Brog and Andre Bormanis. Not, neither of those two need any introduction. Friend of the show, Andre Bormanis. Um, oh, you mean that guy? We know him. Who, yeah, who that, likes that guy. cats. <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
and uh, and Brandon, these two uh, previously collaborated on Identity Part One, mm -hmm. uh, nothing left on Earth excepting fishes, which was the uh, the skewering of uh, uh, stellar cartography made into uh, religion. What is that? What is that called again? Uh, astrology. There, there you go. Was, I couldn't, was, I couldn't no, that wasn't the right one. No, that was the uh, krill one. Oh, that's right. That was the krill one. That was. Yeah. you're right. You're, you're correct. That was. I uh, know because that's the, that Billy, the Billy Joel, Joel episode. That was the Billy Joel episode. Oh yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, uh, and into the fold, which is also uh, kind of a kind of a an episode. That was the one with the shuttle crash with Isaac. Right, right, right. It was with and Isaac Claire. and Finn, and, and a lot yeah. of uh, a lot of kind of like zombie like creatures in there. Um, uh, this episode directed by oh, Seth sure. MacFarlane. Uh, just kidding. Just trying to trying to even up the tables after last week. This one actually was John. Was actually John. Was actually John Cassar. Got it. Uh, music by John Debney. Uh, and yes. I thought it was very powerful. Very, very Jamie Horner ish. Very. Uh, there was some Philip Glass in there too. Yeah. Like there was, and some like when Philip Glass's work has been used to like convey space, it's so good. And when they mm -hmm. were heading into the expanse, it had that like deep. Yes. Bass, uh, you know, brass stuff. And mm. it was awesome. It was so it was good. Really, really good. Yeah. Um, and our favorite, our new, uh, maybe not favorite admiral, but our newest admiral to appear on the Orville is uh, Paul Definitely Christie. Definitely not our favorite. <laughs> Vice, Vice Admiral. They called him out by rank. Vice Admiral Paul Christie. Um, started way back in the 80s working on projects like Remington Steel, North and South. He was in books one, two, and three. Uh, and he'll be back on the Roddenberry Podcast Network when Mission Log covers Workforce Parts 1 and 2 during Season se season 7 coverage of Star Trek Voyager. Look for that episode to drop sometime in 2025. 20, uh, Not ish. shocking. Not shocking. Uh, depending. Um, so a vice, a vice admiral um, in the United States Navy has three stars. Um, the Planetary Union, all of the admirals we've seen have five stars in a ring. On their on their epaulets on their shoulder insignia, um, you have so a this rear would suggest he's at a lower rank than. Well, I don't know. It would suggest to me that the Planetary Union uses different insignia than the U.S. Navy does. <laughs> that's uh, that's all I get. So well, but uh, like you can, I would extrapolate: Admiral, Vice Admiral, President, Vice President. But but uh, correct. So where it goes, uh, there's nobody there's, knows. There in the U.S. Navy, there's uh, five ranks of admiral: rear admiral, lower half, which is a one star; rear admiral, upper half, which is a two star; vice hmm. admiral is a three star; and then just plain rank of admiral is a four star admiral. And then we get into a fleet admiral, which is a very rare uh, and 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 higher rank that's given out. Uh, that is five stars. Only uh, only a number of people have held that throughout history. And like the other admirals on the Orville, um, there may have been some inspiration from a real life admiral. Uh, the real world Admiral Christie that I identified was Ralph W. Christie, born in Somerville, Massachusetts. Seems like a lot of things kind of swirl around New England on this show. It's shocking. Shocking, I know. Uh, wow, what in, a coincidence. Born in Somerville, Massachusetts, August 30th, 1893, graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1915 and served on a variety of warships. He was trained in torpedo design and implementation. Christie was one of the first students of the submarine school at New London. Connecticut. He went on to command several submarines, including the USS Octopus in 1918. Shush up. That's Wiki a great... Wiki Wikipedia be damned if, if that's it's wrong. A well, it could be, but <laughs> that's an amazing name. Uh, he graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Is that MIT? Yeah. Got it. And after I didn't know war, MIT was Massachusetts. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, sure. It's a good school, and mechanical engineering ain't easy. Uh, nope. I heard. I would have no idea. I knew it, one person who. Went I was to an aviation MIT. major, so yeah. You went uh, to MIT? No, 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 no. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, after the war, Christie was given command of naval forces in the Philippines. He retired from the navy in August 1949 with what's called a tombstone promotion to the rank of. Wait for it. Fleet admiral. Vice admiral. Uh, just like, just like our Paul Christie. So, but he was dead. No, a tombstone engineering is one that you get on the day of your retirement, not on the not on the day of your death. That would weird. That would, that would just be mean. But that's uh, all weird. Yeah. So that's what they Still, call it. It's kind of like as you're retiring, they're like, eh. Yeah, you deserve it. Take, take an to. extra star with you for the effort. Weird. If anybody, uh, if anybody asks you where you got it, tell them it fell off a truck. It's like honorable 
discharge, yeah. essentially. Um, Is there ever a good discharge? So he passed away in Hawaii in 1987 at the age of 94, and his wife joined him at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific following her death in 2002 at the age of 100. Holy moly. So, canola. yeah, good for them, man. Good genes back in the, uh, uh, you know, being born, you know, in the 18th, 1800s, early 1900s. Seriously. I mean, it must, yeah. yeah. Wow. Recurring cast, we have Victor Garber back as Admiral Halsey. If you want to hear more about him, you'll have to go back and listen to very early episodes of Mission Log the Orville, because we covered him early on. Extensively. Kai Wenner is back as Ty Finn, BJ Tanner as Marcus Finn, and Gavin Lee... R.I.P. Maybe for the last time <laughs> as Nurse Henry Park. I love that you had, had just didn't let it go. That we Where's Nurse Park been? Where has he been? Where's Ensign Park been? Where and, has he been? And Because, you know, you you're, you got tabs on Turco and you got tabs on Park. And I just... And wasn't, when there, I, wasn't there an Ensign Parker early on who we loved very, very early No, I think on? it was him, wasn't it? Okay, wasn't yeah, there, there, was, there was definitely Nurse or Park. Or no, there was another guy, too. Yeah. I think you're right. So maybe I'm conflating the two. However... When I have my first, you know, recurring char- character on a TV show, we love people like you that keep an eye out for us. So <laughs> <laughs> this is that's a good thing. It's it's very nice, but unfortunately, well, you know what? We may see him again as may, you know, you know, one what? of these he's, aliens. He, you know, he's not dead as long as we remember him. Oh, sorry. Um, Yikes. He, may, he may not be dead at all. And maybe uh, they can reverse engineer some kind of like DNA unrewriting, like a like a DNA control Z sort of I think it's sort pretty, of thing. Because I think um, in Genesis, the TNG episode, is that right? Right. They also were able Brandon to Braga. Because because yeah. um, O'Brien <laughs> uh-huh. basically has the same eyes that these guys do, right. right? Like so, but they were able to revert back thanks to data i thought that yeah. i think that that was a silent nod to data of saving the day in that episode because when it came up to isaac and didn't know what to do to it mm-hmm. uh it was like oh okay that's the one that would have healed them if they had done the you know beat for beat the same Staring episode contest yep um and so you know if is it we are not here to compare apples to apples or or even apples to oranges but like uh if you if you think about it and i'm not the first person to think about it i'm sure but basically the krill are basic i think they're like the cardassian and the bajorans Mm -hmm. together because they got the religious and then like the fervent like you know domination and then you have mucklins aka uh cling on and i think whatever we encounter today is or you know in this episode is the organic borg essentially right how freaking awesome was that was her so, kick ass so much fun kick ass tala was so fun uh, one more thing to cover real quick uh, we no oh, longer sorry. have an air date on these shows we have a premiere uh, date uh-huh. uh streaming day june 9th 2022 um, but yeah, man, absolutely. Uh, kick-ass Tala Kiali was, was great to see. I just realized we hadn't gotten to see, even very rarely did we get to see what's-her-face's extent of her fighting mm-hmm. capabilities. And right. this is when you start seeing, uh, the Orville's already getting praised for this, but the right kind of use in storytelling and effects increasing with the budget mm-hmm. as opposed to hey let's just throw all the money into fireworks they're right. they're they're getting great stunt coordination and a longer scene where we can just see her beat the live it was a, an intense awesome scene so i was really stoked about that it was and that whole scene of um you know john lamar uh running away through the conduits which are the official names of the the jeffries tubes on the on the Orville, we the found out today. The yeah. conduits, yeah. Conduits. Conduits. Um, I don't know. I was thinking we were going to call them maybe, uh, I don't know. Lily's tubes. Yes. But then some... you get, yeah, Fallopia's tubes. No, I was thinking maybe more with one of the ship designers, somebody who was, you know, responsible there. But conduits is the official name, so. McFarland's uh... tubes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, that that scene, I thought he was just brilliant when he got out of there and, and locked him, used the brig as a uh, as a as a sanctuary. It uh, was behind the brilliant. force field. And then to have them buck up against it 
uh-huh. was f- that was one of the more yeah, frightening that, moments. That, that that motion of the two of them of the two doom, 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 you know um, polymorphs trying to get in or whatever they were they were called um, trying to get in and then Tala coming in saying hey come get me you Beholes. big dummies yeah yeah it was so it was she was just she rocked it yeah. she really it. We don't need anyone to prove their worth ever. Mm-hmm. And they're, we talked about this on About a Girl. You don't need to go, hey, you provide something to society, thus you're worthy. And we never needed Tala to do anything in order to be worthy. But it was just so good to see her used to her full potential. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's and there's so much more to talk about. Yeah, too. and you know, we, we chatted about the uh, the conduits real quick, and you know, one of the things I noticed during the show several times, because it was an episode, I think, like, I, I didn't compare minute by minute or anything, but I felt like we got more exterior shots of the ship in this episode than we did in Electric, electric Sheep. I don't um, know if that's true, because think about, we, we <laughs> I would actually... Oh, yeah, 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 we had the whole, uh, the whole Pterodon shakedown right outside. We had outside that. The, uh, yeah. We had them, I mean, even if it was sh- small, it wasn't like ex- establishing shots of the outside, uh-huh. but they were working on the ship. Right. Um, they were in the docking bay. Yeah. Um, oh, they were but, showing off the ship. They, they definitely were. Um, and so, the whole, and the, even the title sequence is so long yeah. and, and egregious, but I, I mean that as Fantastic. a compliment. That's okay. I, I mean it in a, as a compliment because yeah. it's just like, look at our ship, look at our ship. <laughs> it's amazing. Just like harps, as if played by angels, as they fly around the it's outside. It's so of the good. Thing. Oh wait, that's another that's another movie, also. Oh crap! <laughs> may the may the firefly be with you. But the uh, but but just just seeing it this week again, just just an appreciation of just the detail and the sort of the reimaging of or the update of the ship and uh, is just just phenomenal. So hats off to Brandon Fayette and the entire team that worked on that. You know, they not only the outside, it. but Doug Drexler, who who you know had a hand in re reshooting the um or redesigning the hangar floor which we got to see in detail um which with a much more kind of functional was he responsible um, appearance for, for it was he responsible for uh engineering too or i, I do not, not know sure? i do not know i just know what i liked what i saw and the team did a good job the set was something that when seth was our guest was talking about how he knows he can just walk on set and see something amazing and you know creating the alien world of these polymorphs as you so lovingly call them that's got to be a f- what P-A- p-a-u-l oh P- morphs. oh my yeah. like a xenomorph but like a because a hundred percent it's alien it's but close. also, here's the yeah. thing. Here's uh-huh. the sticking point I have with xenomorphs or xenomorphs. <laughs> okay. All it means is unknown alien. Yeah. It's not a name, <laughs> but we just call them xenomorphs. And there are so many un- unknown aliens, apparently, that the uh, the official name of the, the xenomorph in alien is like xenomorph, like J113. I see. Okay, so they haven't lost sight of that. So they yeah. recognize that. But a lot of people think that that's the race. That's it's the, not the race. That's it's not a the, descriptor yeah, of exactly. what we don't know. So yeah, you're, these are definitely poly, Paul E. Paul. Morphs. Wait, Paul, Paul e. Christie Morphs. Paul Christie Morphs. Yes. See, that's it's why they put us good together. Good job, dude. That's why. That's because we make what we what we do better. Um, that so was great. Speaking of Admiral Paul Christie, man, is he? Uh, is he Claire Finn's type? Like, I or, or, totally or, agree with the forbidden fruit. Yeah, I but, think that was the draw. Yeah, so the forbidden fruit thing from her edge, but from his end, man, to me, that's just abusing, you know, teacher-student relationship. Honestly. Yeah, so I, I watched this episode with my boyfriend, who was like, "That's creepy." Was he? Yeah. His prof- and. As someone who loves a good professor or two, or loves a good boss or two, I have in my time, mm-hmm. I would tell you it's not creepy because there is something sexy about somebody that's above you. There is, but but yes, there can be the issue of um, taking advantage of the position that one is in, right. and so I'm. I am not saying I like it as an excuse for it to happen, but the line is very, very blurred and often taken advantage of. Yeah. So um, even if Claire Finn at 25, or if she's a medical school student at 28, graduates and makes the conversation. And he was young back then. He was probably only like 60. 
Yeah, no, he was doing. That. <laughs> I'm not. Hey, when you're a professor or you know a senior, it doesn't matter how old you're. <laughs> yeah, no, I I know because you know in the world of you know flight instructing and you know uh, you know different dynamics that that happen sure. in my field. Sure. Um, you know th- those kind of things happen, but man, it's it's kind of up to the person who is in charge in charge to not go there. And we know why, because it is so often abused, is, is my yes, point. Yes, because whether you know it or not, you have undue influence on the other person. Mm-hmm. Whether you know it or not, you know, there's, 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 there's going to be something in the back of Clara's mind as, you know, of, or any person's mind of, will this affect my grade? Will this affect my ability to get through medical school? Will this, um, you know, have detrimental effects if I don't go along with it. It's going to be there. It has to be there, consciously or subconsciously. And it's up to the person in charge to just avoid that situation. Yeah, I agree. And I maybe think... I'm where fun goes to die. I don't know. But that's just, that's just you know, kind of what I'd I've come rather, to learn over the years. I'd rather the world... Well, no, and that's it. That's just it. It's application of learning that this situation doesn't always play mm-hmm. out well, and it more often than not, doesn't. So I guess all I'm just trying to offer is I, I've been there, done that, kind of and or i can see the draw and so it is ten every we, we all want to f- try something that we're not supposed to but the world does need more of you guys and you guys are out there but that go ah, i don't think that's good yeah I, at, at the very least it was good that they addressed that that's weird that you did that you know mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to just straight up condoning it and we are also are looking at one of the most pragmatic people on the ship. So that's what I'm saying. Even if she is 28 and aware, she's still 28 and, and hot and, for teacher. And, and, and I liked her description of, I kind of look at it now like I'm looking at a daughter. You know, I kind of feel bad for her, but I knew she had to go through it to learn yeah. what she needed to learn. That was a really good perspective. Um, and I think I could definitely probably look back at some things I've done in my life as, yeah, I was, you know, I was a kid and I had to do that to get to where I am now. So I think that was, I think that was good advice. But I mean, then that is the problem though, of yeah. like, let's, especially if, there are women who are in power too that take advantage of their younger. Oh, I've been uh, taken advantage of. I mean, you. I'm that's, kidding. Like, I, no, I, I. I haven't. Been. But some people sorry. have. Like they're. Yeah. Both, uh, no, no, no! Don't be sorry. There was a congresswoman who had to step down because she was dating one of her interns or something, mm-hmm. and because she said if this were a man, I and they found out about it, they, I, they would, we would want them to step down. Um, so it does. It definitely these these disparities exist in all forms of relationships but when someone is younger than the other the one who's older has to has to use a little bit better sense yeah and it's i would say you know younger older you know definitely has has a role um but in a position of power or position of influence over the other one that's that's really to me where the line gets drawn totally i yes yes i think we can get into it in, in a whole different way but i agree with you i think i'm i'm Picking up what you're putting down, Mike. Okay. All right, good. I appreciate right. it. Um, but man, he just seems like an old man with regrets. I, I bet he he reminds me of the kind of guy. And I think I think anybody who spent any time in corporate America or even in academia, you know, knows the kind of person that just spends their whole life self promoting. You know, mm-hmm. and they just mm-hmm. you know, there's no relationship is important enough. They're just they're just you know, they look good. They're the life of the party. They're always holding court. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, that leaves you kind of empty because you don't build the kind of relationships that hopefully you should be building along the way. And I think that's what he kind of regrets at this point in his life. And is well, looking now back he and, has a whole brood. Yeah. <laughs> so he's not going to be alone anymore. I <laughs> <laughs> I would love. I think I've known my fair share of dudes that are on that traje- trajectory, uh-huh. ha- have are on the other side of that age. I don't think it's an unreasonable way to live through life, but I do think some people and some you, it, it, there's there's the stereotype, and it exists for a reason that some dudes circle back around ten years later and go, "I made a mistake. Uh-huh. I made a mistake." There's a great. Uh, it's the that's most why they random. Don't call it, that's why they don't call it Facebook. They call it, you know, girls I went out with in high school and think I can go out with again book. Uh, wow. That's it, 100%. Yeah. Is, but, uh, yes. <laughs> so I understand. And, and, I've, and I've been the recipient of that. Um, there was a Jason Sudeikis and Ashley Olsen TV movie or film. And, and 
and Ashley Olsen says to Jason Sudeikis' character, well, he changed for me. You know, he was the guy, he, he changed for me. And he goes, oh, no, no, he didn't. And she goes, well, what do you think? When do men change? He goes, I, I, he might have changed, but he didn't change for you, is what he said. And I'm like, Ugh. And she said, well, what, when do men change? And he said, usually when it's too late. Oh, my gosh. That's... Uh... Now, there is also the stereotype, too, is like some of those guys that are lonely or like kicked around and playboyed it up. When they set their mind, it's like I think about company. The, the musical company. Are you familiar with that? I know it. Um, Sondheim, where it's basically everybody in, that are in couples, whether happy or sad, are telling this 30-year-old bachelor, which is funny to us now, that he, you should start thinking about settling down. But instead, he's got three chicks he does the runaround on. And it's just basically an exploration of relationships. And there's an amazing song at the end called Being Alive. And he's trying to work through why would you want somebody to be there. But I think what I always bothered me about that, and this is the romantic side of me talking is he just was open to finding a relationship now. So he was just going to find one as opposed mm -hmm. to, he could have already passed the one up, but we can, we can meet people along. Anyway, I don't know what exactly I'm saying. It's just, it's a little, sometimes men's approach to love is so unromantic that it it bums me out thus the conversation i was having before we recorded today but yeah it, it's true and i heard an adage that you know men marry women hoping they won't change women marry men hoping they will yikes We're both wrong or both wrong and how about this men uh marry the woman who, who's there when they're ready to get married. Like these are things yeah. that I've been told. So it's not like they're married. And you're totally right. Like if you're going into a relationship and I'm speaking to the stereotypical woman, I'm sure there's people that are on either side of the gender, non-gender sides, the things that go into relationships, helping people to change. Um, if you're going into that, looking at the person and saying, this is what they are, but I want them to be different. That's on you when they don't change. And, Amen, sister. And then if a guy, if a person's hoping that my boobs won't sag over time, then that's their problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Listen, I, I, I don't do. know how many messages, morals, and meanings there are in this episode. We're not, we're not even in that part him. yet. We're just, we're just in the fun part still. So well, no, I know. Oh, are you still in the fun part? Okay, we're great. We're still Let's in the fun part. Going. So I, you know, I also, you know, I was, I was visibly kind of, uh, you know, shook it. Uh, yeah, just just sort of sort of you know pukey when when Claire described Paul as somebody who just wanted a smiling face to come home to uh, right. a bed a bed warmer. He didn't want a partner, um, which is amazing. I mean, I was I was lucky. My parents had you know what has been referred to some time uh, for you know some time ago anyway as a democratic relationship. They were both very equal. It was it was flat. They were they were even. They were co partners. Um, there was no you know kind of hierarchy between the two of them. And I think for a couple that got married in like 1957, that was probably pretty, you know, pretty, you know, progressive. Um, so that's always kind of been my model for a relationship is, you know, two people, you know, hand in hand, walking next to each other, um, you know, ready to, uh, you know, take on things as partners. Support yeah. each other, obviously, as needed, but not, you know, a follow me kind of thing or a, I'll tell you what to do or, oh, she's the boss, you know, right. mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. I just got to cower in my little, you know, place over here. Like, none of that is good. You know, it should be a partnership, in my humble opinion. That does depend on someone's willingness to be healthy and independent at the same time and be willing to ask for help. And I know that they're out there and it's proof. That, but like of your parents and also other people that are pretty well adjusted, they are good relationships out there. I'm so curious where they got that notion or, and some people just got lucky by marrying the right person with whom they felt equal to, you know? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure. I just, I know I have my new wet, my latest uh, wedding toast though. Uh, oh yeah. Salatalo Cavespa Coloy. Bad. Bad. That is that that is, that that would that not make a great wedding bad. toast? No? Okay, bad. sorry, sorry, I take it back. N Nolite te bestardes. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that? You and me were going to be the highlight of the show. That's it. Um, so, man, that scene between Isaac and Admiral Christie uh, when Admiral Christie goes to 
Isaac for advice on, yeah, yeah. on Claire. Uh-huh. Um, while funny and, yes. you know, sort of eh, This whatever. episode has some good jokes, good, some, yeah, some good yuck yucks. Is- sure. But Isaac's delivery of, do you also find it a challenge to process her daily absence? Are you suggesting? Oh. I know. Oh, my God. I know. So good. They again, are really making us root for Isaac. Yeah. And again, Mark Jackson with with such limited tools to emote. Mm-hmm. You know, just just hand gestures and a little tilt of the head, and he gets it done. Mm-hmm. Amazing to me. And I love watching his just Fangers. small hand movements. <laughs> his what? Fangers. His fingers do small little <laughs> gesticulations forward sometimes. And yep. he, when he, he, it's like, and I'm sure if you were to ask him, he's process, like his, the way his fingers move is how he processes things. I would imagine. It's a hundred percent fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's that's great that's acting. He he's, he's got, he's got hand and finger movement and just a little bit of a head tilt and he works it for everything, uh, everything. That it it's really proof for. that you don't need to do a lot in order to get your point across. You know what I mean? Um, there's a great acting adage that I blew my mind when I learned it. And it's no, don't show. Like if someone were to ask you to act right now and say, uh, you know, um, look at the look at the clock to see what time it is. You know, you're, you're going to look at the clock and be like, ooh, one, two, three, four. Why would you do that? <laughs> when you look at the clock as a normal human, you just like glance over at it. it you might look blank in the mind, mm-hmm. but you're just checking the clock as a normal person. And and you know what? Um, <laughs> what? In, in that scene, um, uh, Paul Christie had that same kind of look when, when Isaac started to say her favorite sexual, sexual positions, positions are. are. He just went... <laughs> he just looked. He didn't look shocked. Yep. He just kind of nope. it just kind of came out of like a bored part of the conversation and looked at him like, yep. "Are you seriously going there?" Uh, a, a lot of great acting again in this episode from everyone, yeah. but uh, you know, especially um, Penny Johnson, Gerald, Gerald Johnson. I always screw Penny. that up. Gerald Johnson, yeah. Jar- Johnson, Gerald, um, Penny uh, right. is great in this. Yeah. Um, the boys are dumb. You never know. The boys are dumb. They're so dumb in this episode. You know who else I is mean, dumb? I mean, Kai is not. Kai's, Kai's, Kai's not dumb. Kai's small. <laughs> to think that Marcus was going to let Kai go back to the, the, the room by himself? Yeah. Marcus, what? I know. Like, Marcus, also, if nothing else, had, like, a lot of good sort of guardian instincts. He and was... No, he didn't, because he was no, about no, to let no, no, Kai no, no. go back. His, historically... Oh, historically, sure. in, in into the fold, and you know, uh, <laughs> not here, not now. No, complete. Well, also, first of all, the captain's going on the away mission every single time on this. Mi- like, so this, I, this is one of those things where I think everybody wanted to get their name in the history books. You know, when, I you're when, totally right. When you're the history totally is right. written, and they're like, well, "Who are the five people that were the first people to go into the expanse and make first contact with this kind of organic, weird life form that even the krill are afraid of?" Like, I think everybody wanted their name to be on, in the history books. I and honestly, that is the right reason why he goes the first time. He should not have gone the second time. But at least and he had the spacesuit on the second time. Why didn't <laughs> they have it on the first time, so Mike? We segued perfectly into this because when you were saying, you know how, how dumb are the boys? I was like, how dumb is Kelly? She just walks up to Wall and she's like, hmm. Ooh. And Claire's like, you may not want to touch stuff. <laughs> and, what, and what is Christy... Looking into like that, that ugh. it's you don't have the story if you don't. Well, it's like every horror movie you ever yep, watch. Exactly. You're just watching it going, Why? Yep. Don't go in there. Don't yep. go upstairs. Yep. Like, the, you know, those commercials a few years ago where there's, where they're like, Hey, we should hide behind that wall of chainsaws. Oh. Why don't we just get in the running car? Like, yeah. It's- <laughs> yeah. No, there's a bunch of knives in that room. Let's go. Yeah. A hundred thousand percent. 
and it's again, a, it, classic horror. Yeah, just and, and they even called it out, you know, with, okay, now entering haunted house, and yes. and you know, uh, Victor Garbo saying, oh, if this actually was a haunted house, I'd say Which, don't go honestly, in there, but it's not, so you're good. I do love that. I love that kind of. <laughs> it wasn't. It was meta, but not meta. Yeah. You know, the only thing I wish they did was I think I think they I wish they had used like Scott Grimes even a little bit more as meta guy, you know, because he did like now entering haunted house, and are you sure you want to go? And he had like a couple of little like you know kind of like the voice of reason kind of thing but i think he was even more like oh this is where if you go into an expanse (laughs) yeah into the aliens that take over our bodies he could have definitely said that and foreshadowed the whole damn thing and it would have been fine yeah um but i think also there is a a point where you can be too glib and Mm -hmm. i think they wanted to throw back in some humor to remind people this at the show can have that and right. but also not hit us over the head with it yeah and it's um i mean you know it's, it's a technique i mean they're, they're, this this episode hit on a lot of tropes and it was you know definitely definitely you know fun uh you know done in a fun way but at the end of the day um there are some good meanings morals and messages that that we want we want to get to eventually um but yeah, a couple of fun quips. You know, it's a big cast though too. So you know, it's amazing how little we've seen in two episodes out of Kelly, Bordis, um, Gordon. Um, yes. You know, they haven't really had much to do. No. Um, so hopefully we'll get. You know, like I said, it's a big cast, and you know, we got ten episodes to kind of squeeze, uh, squeeze as much out of everybody as as we can. I think I'm waiting. Even though we have seen. John Lamar do some awesome things. I'm waiting for a John Lamar episode. I'm waiting for another Kiali episode. And I'm Mm -hmm. waiting for, like, a a, a Gordon episode. I have a feeling... Excuse me. I have a feeling that they'll pair him up with Charlie um, again. Because there's some some commiseration there. But we need... I think we need a Jamar. I love calling him Jamar. We need a Jamar-centric... Uh, episode. I've just, been, I've just been waiting for it. Yeah, he's. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, been a while since he uh, he was in majority rule, which uh, right, right, yeah, which was definitely a lot of fun. Um, so you referred to this in your recap. I noticed mm-hmm. that you used the word that uh, uh, the polymorph escaped sick bay. Uh, Claire also said before he escaped sick bay, and I was like, oh, is that how you're selling it, Claire? He escaped sick bay. Uh huh. Like, don't you have to be like restrained or like. Or Why like was it he up quarantined? How to escape? Like no, he just he didn't escape. He left. He left. <laughs> he he could go. Of sick bay, and who paid the price? Nurse Park, and and it's, others. That's that's blood on Finn's hand. <laughs> that definitely that definitely is. The, um, he wasn't in a bubble. He should have been in a bubble. Should have been quarantined. He should have been. He, he had been. eyeballs on his head. Yeah. Multiple, head, like like head. more than two, yeah, more than two. Um, did you recognize the uh, the random red shirt in what I think was the mess hall? I did not. Yeah, no. I was like, oh, who's the random red shirt? I bet uh, I bet that's a new recurring character. Oh, and he's dead. Yep. Oh, and he has a name, Lieutenant Woodson. Uh, but he's kind of dead. Maybe he, not. <laughs> I don't think we'll see him again. <laughs> Probably not. But uh, yeah, he's his inability to believe children. Got him where he is today. That's right. Believe children. There's um, no one here. And that was actually a very cool uh, Jurassic Parky and scene. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. I also liked the uh, there's there's and I don't know if this is intentional or not, but I tend to think that very few things are unintentional on the show. Um, the uh, Salayan sandstone. Yeah, um, sunstone. I just couldn't, I, sunstone. I just could not help but think of uh, Star Trek Beyond when uh, Carl Urban as Dr. McCoy was like. You gave your girlfriend an alien tracking device. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> you Holy... gave your girlfriend radioactive jewelry. That was not my intention. However, you gave your convenient. girlfriend an alien tracking device. <laughs> That's incredible. That's exactly right. Oh, what a good, what a good. Trek, hey, though. you know, I mean, every once in a while, I get to contribute something. If it works, <laughs> you've done pretty well so far today. But if All it right. works, it works. All right, you ready to start talking about the serious part of the show, oh, which I think we've fine. somewhat been doing? Right, let's do it. All right, you'll see you on the other side. Bye. Okay, Mike, 
we've come to the part of the show where we explore the big ideas in the episode Shadow Realms, and we're going to discuss the messages, morals, and meanings. And we're going to discuss whether this episode aligns with the Roddenberry Star Trek philosophy. Now, there is a lot to digest about this episode, right? There really is, you know, and there are a couple of, you know, sort of serious, I think I'll go with quotes from the episode okay. that I kind of wanted to unpack a little bit. Um, the first one being when Claire said, I read this in a really old book. So, of course, I went on a fruitless hunt for this really old book that I couldn't find. But it, it Really? Is with, yeah, I couldn't, find, I couldn't find the quote anywhere. So maybe the really oldness of the book was like the 22nd century or the 23rd century, just not the 24th or, or I guess they're in the 25th. Um, right, right, right. It is only with greatest care that memory can be kept from becoming a prison or a gallows. And Kelly said, yeah, I can get on board with that or, or some, something to that effect. Um, because, you know, the past, man, it always seems better than it is. You know, and maybe it was better for, you know, in, in, in some things, but you kind of distill those memories down to the good parts, you know, and you're, you know, you're younger, you're hipper, you're, you know, less, uh, um, maybe less encumbered by, you know, mortgage and, and knee pain and things like that. Um, sure. And the past seems great. And if all you're doing is thinking about it, man, you're missing out on life because all you have is right here, right now, today. That's it right now. The second once you lose it, it's gone. That We just lost that second. It's gone. I, I enjoyed the hell out of it, though. <laughs> you could. You, were, you nailed it. <laughs> I mean, that, was a, that was a great instant. But I don't want to dwell on it because it's yeah. gone. Yeah. Um, the surefire ticket to depression is dwelling on the past. And yeah. it's as someone who has done that uh, and experienced depression because of that, what I didn't even realize I was doing that. I was ruminating and uh, rose tinted glassing it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's hard to recognize when you're doing it, but when you get, when you start going, oh, right now sucks, right now sucks, or whatever, I wish, I wish, I wish, those kind of phrasings mm -hmm. usually are good tip-off. Um, and it kind of dealt with what they dealt with in the last episode from last week. Yeah, is it did. You don't, so, like, we're dealing with the past in this episode. Isaac is unable to see the future, so mm -hmm. he's having anxiety and trying to control the future. Right. Um, so Not thinking things will change. Right. So... Yeah. There's many different ways to unwellness. Um, I th the thing that's strange about this, though, which is I think what makes it a challenge, and just like anything, a practice in life, because um, like mental wellness is a practice as opposed right. to a it state is like of working being. out. Like what is your like what is your mental health regime? Like your physical health regime? And that doesn't mean you can't all of a sudden succumb to it because of a trigger or two. You know what I mean? It's Correct. not any you indication. Can't get, you can't help but get physically sick. Like you can't help but be suffering from mental illness. Hundred percent. Yes, exactly right. Um, it's the. I think I lost my train of thought. However, you've hit the nail on the head. It's. We're, we're all doing our best. If we can try our best to maintain a healthier sense of self, then we're going to do it the best we can. Yeah. And I'm going to piggyback a little bit. Uh, if, you, if you don't listen to Mission Log, the podcast, which covers each and every episode of Star Trek, um, I, I encourage you to do so if you're a fan of that series. And I'll piggyback a little bit on something Norman C. Lau said um, as a fan of... Um, um, Babylon 5, uh, where he quoted a line that said, you know, the past tempts us, the future confuses us, and we spend our lives on this 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 narrow slice of time. And I'm kind of ad-libbing here because I can't remember the exact quote, but, we, but our life is kind of wasted away being, you know, reminiscent of the past and nostalgic about it and fearing the future. And if you just kind of go through your whole life like that, it just it just becomes wasted. So uh, I mean, just, you reminded me what my point was based off of that. It's what's hard to not get caught in the trap of looking backward, too, is at a certain point up to the moment you die, everything that's happened to you in this life is mm -hmm. nothing but a memory. Right. And yes, that doesn't mean this moment. That's, that's why it's the practice really is being in the moment. That's mm -hmm. not easy to do. Even Buddhist monks can't do it. Uh, if you were to try to meditate right now and count to five and clear your head of everything else the second you think of something you have to start over again you'd have a hard time getting past three it's amazing how quickly your brain mm -hmm. will go 
to just fill the void. But that doesn't mean you're failing at being in the moment. It means you're practicing being at the moment. That, that's that's a really good point, you know. And and as far as you know, the ruminating or thinking about the past versus the present, uh, I read something the other day that was just sort of like one of those like top ten things that'll blow your mind. And one of them was like, uh, you and your best friend will not be able to attend each other's funerals. It's like, oh, that's that's sad, right? Because right. one of one of you can die first, or if you die together, you can't go to either one. Anyway, Jesus. Um, but that was that's a little bit you know a little bit morbid. But it's things that maybe we don't no. think about. That's how I think yeah. about that crap all the time. It's yeah. pretty it's pretty effed up. But another thing that I said to think about is that we spend so much time thinking about the past and how we could have done things to affect the present, but we hardly ever think about the present and the effect that it will have on the future. That's an impactful statement right there. That's a it's a really succinct way to explain quote unquote manifestation which is a really triggering word for some people because mm -hmm. um, it's like oh, of course you can manifest the things you want but really in reality it, what it's referring to is how your 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 mindset your subconscious and conscious mindset creates the reality that you deserve or want and right. if it's negative it's going to potentially mm -hmm. give you that negative feedback oh, it's almost like we're talking about new thought again t-h-o-u GHD. Which still blew my mind. Blew my mind. Um, anyway, as you can see, I'm losing light. So uh, let's let's run down the gallows. Of this All righty. So um, unmarried men look younger, feel older. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm married, so I am I am aging uh, you got on the outside and the inside. You got a baby face. You you're, <laughs> oh, you 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 look your age, if not younger. So. Uh, I appreciate that. So, Thank no, you very I'm, much. You you get it. You get that compliment. Um, yeah. I think, I think it makes sense that that might be somewhat true because men who tend to George Clooney it are really good looking baby face right. dudes, you know? Yeah. Um, and then they get hit by the reality stick and they're like, oh, sh I'm lonely. And again, not all of them do. And it's okay if they don't. There's all sorts of lifestyles. I, if I hear the, the phrase ethical non-monogamy one more time, I'm going to puke. <laughs> but at the same time, it is a nicer way to say, I don't want a relationship. Would you like to be my sex partner? And so it, I don't know. I think they probably do feel older because it's a lot of emotional juggling that they're doing and a lot of compartmentalization. Um, and again, this is a really gendered speak and really like, I'm sure there's women out there who feel the same. I'm sure there's non-gendered people who feel the same, but you know, my there's experience. Just is, there's just people. We're all just, we're all just people. Uh, yes. But you can, but stereotypes are also stereotypes yeah. for a reason mm -hmm. too, you know, right. that's all. Um, I like the couple of, there were, there were three or four different sort of science-y um, quips in the show. Uh -huh. uh, Ed Mercer saying, do you have any direct evidence right. of these demons? Which was nice. It is written in the Ancana. That is all the evidence we need. Right. Um, he said all supernatural legends have a basis in the mortal world. Right. Uh, kind of makes sense that there might be something out there that gave him these... Uh, these ideas, and even said later, demons. That's what. That's what. That's what this would appear to. Uh, you know, a, a highly religious group. And um, in a weird way, that's Ed slash Seth slash Kassar being accepting of how people get to their frame of thought too. Yeah, because it, it does it have did, basis and things. It, you know, it did. It definitely seemed like they were more accepting of the krill religion and then ie religion in this episode um then maybe they had been in the past you know or they were like hey this is how they deal with things this is how they this is how they explain things this is how things seem to them well i would counter that with maybe they just they wanted to understand their religion and that's why they wanted the Ancala. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, they maybe judged it before, but but you are even quick to point out we have those mid episode answer and question sentences where it's like, mm -hmm. are we doing the right thing? Who are we to say morality? Yeah. So uh, what we're really seeing, which is not really a common practice, is trying to understand where the other sentient life is coming from. And, right. and and now that they had some time with the grill, um, understanding got has been bridged a little bit, right? So they're a little more patient with their dogma, even. Right. So perfect segue into messages, morals, and meanings. So that um, you know that patience, that that sort of understanding, that 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 legitimate 
willingness to understand somebody who thinks differently than you do. Um, am, am I summing up what you what you were saying? Mike, you Some, always make accurate. me sound succinct. <laughs> Doesn't matter how many words it takes either. No, truly. Because <laughs> I'll say more. I, rest assured. Um, but yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I thought this was a really fun haunted house episode. Um, you know, with one major difference, man. You know, the good guys didn't kill the bad guys at the end of the show with a pithy one liker liner like, uh, here's your courtesy tap, mother. You know, or oh uh, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, the Russell Crowe joint yep. from a couple of couple of years ago. Wow. Um, but it was, you know, it was one of those things where you know they had they had the means and the opportunity to just sort of vanquish the enemy, kind of like Kirk did in Arena. Mm-hmm. Kind of, kind of like um, in uh, Is There in Truth No Beauty? Um, Is Arena the, the first uh, episode? Series? Of the series, I don't remember. I'm sorry. It's not. Arena is not the first episode. Of no, the it was. No. It was. Uh, I believe a season one episode. I'm not 100. percent I know it was, it was Gorn. season one. I just, yeah. yeah, no, I know it was the Gorn. I yeah. just didn't remember. But right. but it's a great example of leadership and compassion. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, you, you know, you got them killed. You know, the Horda. You know, they could have you know found a way to kill that Horda. You know, no no questions asked. They found out it was intelligent and found out a way to uh, communicate with it. And right. This is this was this. Now there was no you know meeting of the minds. There was no final scene where it was like give me your hand. And you know they you know they decided to be friends at the end. Um, but it was you know with Ed's Ed's line of um, you know they were our crew members. You know, can't we find a way to talk to them and avoid killing all of them? You know, I mean, that is that I think is in the, you know, the finest in in sci-fi and humanistic and and Star Trek philosophy. I I really do. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you wholeheartedly. We would have looked differently on Ed as a leader if he didn't do that. Yes. Even subconsciously, Uh, because you can't quite blame him. Right. You know, and you just let them die, you know. There was the conversation, and Gordon was like, "Hey, it's us against them, and and I pick I pick us." He's not you know? ha- he's not half wrong either. Yeah, and and I think I think I think you have to ramp up to that level of of willingness to um, I don't know commit genocide, not even genocide because it was just a just a, a number of them, you know, to commit mass murder. Um, sure. Or to just just kill people in in a war, you've got to have that opportunity. You've got to at least give yourself the opportunity to talk and avoid that. Um, but the decision to let these folks live instead of just killing them, you know, are they intelligent? Claire made contact with the polymorph, you know, and it became obvious that he was intelligent, although angry and violent and willing to come back, but intelligent. <laughs> um, I think it was the right the right decision. Uh, were the Aurelians evil? You know, I, they theorize that that's how they propagated the species. Right. You know, that it was, you know, spores that, um, you know, infected people and created these, uh, these, these polymorphs. Right. Um, polymorphs. So yeah. funny. But it reminded me of a line Peter Capaldi delivered in the, as the 12th doctor. Um, when he asked, he was asked in one episode if he thought the universe was evil, and his reply was, hardly anything is evil, but most things are hungry, and hunger looks very like evil from the wrong end of the cult, from the cutlery, or do you think that your bacon sandwich loves you back? <sighs> yeah, like I, like I saw that when it aired, you know, five or six years ago, uh, maybe longer than that now, and just, just, I actually wrote that line down, because wow. it just, it just struck me so hard, it said, you know, hey, not evil, just but but um, you know survival. survival instinct is pretty darn strong, um, and I think this kind of decision holds up you know very well with you know things like the Corbin might maneuver when they went back to help a guy that had you know for all in, for all appearances looked like they were trying to kill him, um, and and countless others. Right. So I I, vo- I vote yes as far as holding up to the Roddenberry philosophy, and I like the messages, morals, and meanings, even though. Um, this was, you know, 
uh, in truth and in fact, kind of a fun haunted house episode. They still were able to work a good message into it. There so. was still very good messages. And Jessica, the romantic, broken hearted girl, also got her fair share of, hey, if I'm going to end up like Dr. Finn, I'm going to be okay. So yeah. And and how'd you think of the uh, the last scene? Was it was that earned? Was it appropriate? Was it? Uh... I ship it. I ship it so hard. Yeah. I ship it so hard. You ship, but, but I but I have heard you in the same conversation ship Ed and Kelly. Ed and uh, uh, Teala, is that her name? The Krill, the Krill woman. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that I do. Okay, you know what? I want them to F again. That's what I really want. Yep. Mission Log the Orville is produced by <laughs> Ron Berry Entertainment. Technical production by the irreplaceable Earl Green. Our website and your opportunity to comment and connect with us and share your ships is podcast.ronberry.com. <laughs> If you'd like to support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash mission log. This gives you the access to the mission log discord where hailing frequencies are open on Wednesday nights at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific. We discuss the latest episodes of the Orville New Horizons and Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Join us next time on Mission Log the Orville as we discuss the Orville New Horizons Mortality Paradox. This is a Roddenberry podcast. For more great podcasts, visit podcast.roddenberry.com.